Assalamu alaikum, my beloved Hazur, ladies and gentlemen, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. We start our proceeding this evening with a recitation of the Holy Quran by Zahir Ahmad, followed by its English translation by Matthew Rahman Khan. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قذامين لله شهداء بالقسط ولا يجرمنكم شنان قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا The translation of the verses that were just recited before you is as follows. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan, the accursed. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the gracious, the merciful. O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is, nearer to righteousness. And fear Allah, surely Allah is aware of what you do. Allah has promised those who believe and do good deeds that they shall have forgiveness and a great reward. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. Your Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, head of the worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and all distinguished guests. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the plea, peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. The Ahmadiyya community was founded in 1889 by His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in a small Indian village called Qadian. We believe him to be the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi, awaited by all world major religions. We believe that God sent him to terminate all religious warfares and to promote an atmosphere of morality, peace, justice, tolerance, 
and brotherhood. He taught his followers to protect the sanctity of both religions and governments by becoming righteous souls and loyal citizens. After his demise in 1908, the institution of Khilafat, also known as Caliphate, was established. Khilafat is that spiritual institute which can only be truly established on percepts of prophethood. Five spiritual leaders have succeeded the promised Messiah, and today we are very fortunate to have the current Khalifa, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, with us. Under the leadership of Khilafat, our community has continually progressed and now has a membership consisting of tens of millions over 207 countries in the world. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community has built over 15,000 mosques, 500 schools, and over 30 hospitals around the world. It has translated the Holy Quran into over 70 languages. The community is active in serving humanitarian causes and providing aid and relief to disaster-struck areas in the world. The values of loyalty, freedom, equality, respect, and peace are key to the foundation of our motto, love for all, hatred for none. And with that brief introduction, let me now invite Mamoun Rashid, the current president of Ahmadiyya Muslim Community Sweden, to introduce us to our keynote speaker, His Holiness Mirza Masroor Ahmad. Auzubillahi minash shaitanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim In the name of Allah the gracious the merciful on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Sweden I would like to take this opportunity to welcome his holiness Mirza Masroor Ahmad may Allah be his helper along with all of our distinguished guests and extend our very warm and profound greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessing of Allah be upon you. This is His Holiness' first visit to Stockholm, the capital city of Sweden. It is a great honor and privilege to be able to have His Holiness with us today. His Holiness is a man of peace, man of God, a spiritual leader to tens of millions of Ahmadi Muslims globally, and now also world-renowned, to have become a man of peace as he has made addresses throughout the world at various parliaments such as Capitol Hill in the United States, the European Parliament in Brussels, Westminster Parliament in London, and New Zealand's Parliament in Wellington. Irrespective of where he has gone, he has always put emphasis on Islam's true teaching of peace, justice, and respect for all peoples and all religions. And with these few words, I thank you all once again. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Hilevi Lawson, who is Member of Parliament and represents the Social Democratic Party. Hilvi, please take the podium and share your remarks. Thank you so much, Your Holiness, dear friends. I had the pleasure of uh, seeing the new mosque in Malmö just the other day. Such a beautiful building. You can see it from a long distance, surrounded with the green trees and uh, lands full of grass. So I, I think it's such a beautiful symbol and when you come into the mosque and meet 
the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and I've also had the honor of meeting His Holiness. Then you, you see the message, it's love, it's tolerance, it's peace. It's not only a beautiful building, it's a beautiful message. A message that I think the world needs more now than maybe ever before, because there is so much conflict going on. There is war, there is hatred, there is violence, and there, there is not only conflict between groups, but also inside groups. It's the opposite of the direction that we need. And in this darkness, we have the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and we have His Holiness. And I think even if it's a dark world right now, I think the message is most needed right now, just because of the darkness, the light is really needed when it's the most dark, darkest. It's one thing that I can't understand, and it is that uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim community and His Holiness is uh, spreading the message around the world. You are in many different countries, and uh, His Holiness is traveling from country to country, and I can't understand why the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is attacked, because I think the more you spread your message, the less people would want to attack you. And especially, it's very strange that Muslims attack you because you are Muslims. The thing that impresses me the most, and I had the honor of discussing this with uh, His Holiness and the other MPs a while ago, is when you are so attacked, uh, why don't you want to get back revenge? It's uh, uh, a natural instinct in human nature, unfortunately. And I, I think we can see in history that uh, the more people are attacked, the bigger the risk that they will want to get, get back it even, get revenge. And maybe they are weakened for a while, but then when they get stronger, unfortunately, they could become the oppressor. First they are the victim, and then they become the oppressor. And with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, I see the opposite. The more hatred you meet, the more love you give. The more war, the more peace you bring. And I'm just so impressed because I would understand if someone who's been attacked a lot wants to get back. I, I wouldn't blame them, but uh, of course I think it's uh, so much more impress impressive to pass by this darkness and try to spread the light because if you give back with darkness, the world will get even darker. You need more light instead. And I think that uh, it's such a beautiful view also on uh, differences, because we have different religions in the world, and His Holiness, Holiness emphasis that that's not a problem. We should be able to unite and meet and together make this world a better place. And uh, I'm, I must say that I had a very positive view on the Ahmadiyya Muslim community before, because I've visited the old mosque in Malmö every year. I'm invited, and many with me. Uh, it's been wonderful meetings, and, and now I've had another dimension, because now I've been in the new mosque and I've met His Holiness. And I think uh, the positive thing is that the more people you meet from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and His Holiness, the more people you have to spread the message, because the more you learn, the more you see that uh, it is not a bad thing, there is nothing bad at all, it is only good, and we can help to spread this goodness. And the wonderful thing also is that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and His Holiness, they don't only speak about peace and love, they actually act on it too. And that's a stronger thing to act than to only speak. And His Holiness have uh, peace meetings where uh, MPs from all the world can visit and learn more and spread the message and also a peace prize. And he also visited world's, world leaders. He sends letters to world leaders. And uh, I think he does uh, so much, oh, only one person, His Holiness, does so many wonderful things. And you are all in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community ambassadors of this message. And I must say that I know a lot of uh, people from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, in Malmö, for instance. And uh, they take part in, in the community, in the political life, in uh, associations we have. And uh, it's all, a lot of ideal work. They don't get paid. They do it to make the community better. 
And also, it's a wonderful tradition of cleaning up after New Year's Eve celebration. When everybody else is tired lying in bed at home after the celebration, we, we have the uh, fireworks and people are up late at night. And uh, you see the Muslims, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, out cleaning up the streets, making it beautiful again. And that's just another action of love. Uh, making us come closer together, promoting harmony and peace. So I'm, I'm just so, I'm just so impressed about it. And you do it in the little things, and you do it in the big things. And I'm so honored for this invitation and the possibility to get to know you better and learn more about your wonderful message. And uh, I will do my best to spread the message: love, peace, tolerance, respect, humility humanitarian uh, peace. Uh, I mean, so many wonderful things combined in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So thank you so much for the invitation. And I look forward to try to spread the message to make this world a better place. Thank you so much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Walter Mutt. Uh, who is Member of Parliament and represents the Green Party. MP Walter, can you please? Your Holiness, dear friends, thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Uh, with peace, I would say that everything is possible, but without peace, nothing is really ho possible, then hope is gone. But with the peace in our hearts, between individuals, between peoples, then we can save the climate, we can save uh, mankind, but also other parts of the wonderful <coughs> creation. We can replenish our oceans with the fish, we can save the climate, we can save the wild animals, small and big, and so on and so forth. So I would say that this wonderful concept you have of peace and love to all and hatred to none. That is really the starting point of my mission as a green politician. And I am so grateful, uh, Your Holiness, and uh, also to the local um, representatives of Amadia in my hometown of Göteborg, Gothenburg, all these wonderful uh, exchange of thoughts we have had. I have an idea that uh, we need in Sweden, a uh, minister of peace and a department of peace. Uh, and I'm so grateful that uh, you have supported me from the Amadia side on this idea of creating a minister of peace. Uh, and um, as um, Hilary Larson also said about Malmö, I have the same wonderful experience in, uh, in my hometown, Göteborg, that you are not only talking, as we politicians sometimes do, uh, but you are really doing things and inviting me every national day uh, and also other days to, to your wonderful <clears throat> Nasser Mosque. And I feel so uh, warm there. You are, have a very natural way of being warm to people. And um, I would say that the, as a politician, of course, I, I'm dealing with all kinds of problems. Uh, but I would say that there are, there are not good people and bad people. There are bad environments. There are bad uh, houses. There are bad uh, bad systems. But in every one of our, each and every one of us, there are this wonderful pot potential. And uh, when you are taking young people in in, in trouble and and so on to your mosque and and doing very good things, I think this is the way forward. It's way forward for all of mankind. So I am so grateful that I have been uh, invited to, to not only this evening, but on a regular basis invited to, to your meetings. Uh, there are so many bad things which have been globalized. Greed and war and hatred has been globalized. Now it's time to globalize solidarity and love for everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Our next speaker is uh, Bengt Eliasson, who is uh, also a member of parliament and represents the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Your Holiness, 
Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Together we are one people of Christian as well as Muslims, Jews as well as Hindus, person of faith as well as non-believers. We are shaped by every language and culture, drawn from every end of this earth. And because we have drunk the bitter cup of war and segregation, because we are determined to leave the dark chapters behind, we cannot help but believe that the old way of hatred shall someday pass. As the world grows smaller, our common humanness shall relieve itself. And stronger and more united, we must all participate to bring about a common era of peace. We must seek a new way forward based on uh, mutual interests and mutual respect. To those leaders around the globe who, who uh, seek to saw conflict or blame their society's ills on someone else, the West or the East, the other ones of the wrong faith, or the wrong color, or the wrong gender, let them know that their people will judge them on what you build, not what you destroy. Let us mark this evening with re remembrance of ho who we are and how far we have traveled. Let us mark this evening, this meeting, in the name of peace, understanding, democracy, and equality. Thank you very much, Amadea community, for this invitation and this chance to join together in the cause of peace and understanding. And Your Holiness, a warm welcome to Sweden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bengt. Now I would like to invite His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, to deliver his keynote address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the gracious, our merciful. <coughs> All the distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <coughs> First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for accepting our invitation to today's event. In today's world, we are passing through a challenging time. It is my belief that the peace of the world is the most pressing and crucial issue facing all of us today. During these challenging times, how can we cope with the situation? I believe it is imperative that all of mankind, irrespective of creed, caste, or color, strives to uphold the basic human values of peace compassion, tolerance, and mutual respect. There is no room in the world for discrimination based on someone's beliefs, religion, or race. And so both the state and religion itself must be free of all forms of prejudice. 
each individual should be free to believe in whatever they like because belief is a personal matter pertaining to one's own heart and mind. Hence, a person should be free to profess according to his or her religious teachings. As I have said, it is the need of the hour that we should all focus on achieving our shared aspirations of establishing true and sustainable peace in the world. Regrettably, the hub of the world's instability and bloodshed lies in the Muslim world because the leaders and governments have disregarded the true teachings of their religion. Nonetheless, those living in the West or other parts of the world should not consider themselves immune from danger because the world has now shrunk into an interconnected global village. Hence, the disorder in one part of the world can no longer be considered a local issue or limited in, his, uh, in its scope. We are already seeing that the instability in the Muslim world is increasingly affecting other parts of the world and indeed has had a direct impact here in Sweden as well. As it is now much easier to travel long distances, in the past year hundreds of thousands of hundreds and thousands if not millions of people have fled their war-torn countries of Syria and Iraq in search of a better future here in the Western world. Due to the generosity of the Swedish government and its public, this country has accepted more than its fair share of refugees. Certainly in comparison to the size of your nation. This gesture and willingness to absorb so many refugees is very laudable and proves that Sweden is filled with open-hearted and kind people. Your benevolence places a burden on the refugees and immigrants who come here and demands of them that they live here as peaceful citizens and remain grateful and indebted to the government and the people of this nation. Indeed, the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, taught that a person who does not express his gratitude to his fellow man cannot be considered grateful to God Almighty. Thus, Muslim refugees and immigrants have a religious obligation to keep in view the favors bequeathed upon them by the country, wherein they have been permitted to live here and to derive benefit from the state. The refugees escaped their previous lives in the search of peace and so, now having been granted shelter and security here, it is incumbent upon them to live here peacefully and to abide by the laws of the land. All immigrants have a duty to integrate and remember that the Holy Prophet of Islam وسلم, taught that love of one's country, of residence, is an essential part of one's faith as a Muslim. Immigrants should remain entirely faithful to their adopted nation and should 
use all of their abilities to help their country advance and prosper. Furthermore, it is also the task of uh, the authorities and the government to ensure that they do not become entirely preoccupied with resettling the refugees and consequently come to ignore the rights of their existing citizens. Already there have been some reports in which local citizens have complained to the media that the refugees are being given preferential treatment. According to one report, an elderly Swedish lady was not given proper medical treatment and was even deprived of adequate food whilst in hospital, whilst the, uh, the refugees were cared for in a much better way. To what extent these reports are accurate, God knows better. But if there is any truth in them, it is alarming and dangerous. If the perceived preferential treatment of the immigrants, uh, immigrants continues in the long term, it could have serious implications. Such injustices will naturally foster resentment and frustration in the hearts of the local people and could easily escalate into hatred against the refugees. The Swedish people have long been known for their generosity and open hearts, but any discrimination against them could trigger a change in attitude that would undermine and threaten the peace of society. Instead of reaping the positive effects of integration and immigration, it could lend, uh, lead to a rise in conflict and hatred. Hence, I would suggest and advise the government and policymakers that they should ensure that the rights of the local people are not unduly effect, uh, affected or neglected in any way. This is a very delicate issue and must be handled with extreme caution and care because if there is any resentment on the part of the local people, it could lead to an extremely dangerous chain reaction. The local citizens could become hostile to the refugees and in turn this could lead to the marginalization of the immigrant, uh, immigrant population. And that sense of isolation could leave some refugees vulnerable to radicalization by extremists. In this way, an extremely dangerous vicious cycle could emerge, threatening the peace and, uh, and security of this nation. If, God forbid, such extremists were able to radicalize even just a few people, it would gravely threaten and undermine this nation's peace, security, and prosperity. As I said, a balance has to be found, and so you will have to tread extremely carefully. Whilst the government should help the refugees settle, they should also make it clear to them that they are expected to stand on their own two feet and con uh, contribute to society as soon as possible. <coughs> on the other hand, the local citizens should also be reminded that Sweden has chosen to accept the refugees due to its moral obligation to serve humanity and therefore the public 
should welcome those arriving with the spirit of service and compassion. I reiterate that it is crucial that you pay great attention to the integration of the recent influx of immigrants into your society. Otherwise, the situation could spiral out of your control. In terms of Islam's teachings, let me reassure you that Islam is a religion of peace, security, and love for all. Islam requires Muslims to love their country, to be loyal to it, and to abide by the laws of the land. This is the message that Imams and Muslims, uh, Muslim clerics should be voicing to all of the Muslim refugees who are coming to the West. They should be told that it is their Islamic duty to be grateful to their adopted nation and its people. They should be reminded that they have been given a second lease of life and the opportunity to raise their children in a country that is free from war and disorder. And so it is incumbent upon them to value and cherish their new home. Moving forward, I would now like to present some Islamic teachings that I believe can play a great role in developing peace at a local societal level, a national level, and indeed at an international level. In chapter 5, verse 9 of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty states, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, and let not a people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah, surely Allah is aware of what you do. The words of this verse are extremely clear, whereby Muslims are instructed to never bear grudges or to seek revenge from their enemies. Rather, they are taught to always remain just and fair in all matters and under all circumstances. See how beautiful this commandment is to establish the peace of the society. Islam has not only called on Muslims to be just, but it has also laid down the standards of justice that are required. In chapter 4, verse 136, Allah the Almighty has said, O you who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witnesses for Allah. Even though it is be against yourselves or against parents and kindred. Hence, Islam teaches that a Muslim should be ready to testify against himself, his parents, or his most loved ones in order to establish the truth and for justice to prevail. Certainly, there can be no higher standard of justice than this. And so, this precept is the gateway to establishing true peace in the world. Another golden principle for the establishment of peace is given in chapter 49, verse 10 of the Holy Quran, where it states that if there is a dispute between nations or groups, third parties should uh, unite and seek to bring about a peaceful resolution to the conflict. If a peaceful resolution is not possible, then nations should stand shoulder to shoulder with one another in an effort to stop 
the cruelties and injustices that are occurring. If the world understands the true value of this principle, then there is still time for mankind to uh, escape the clutches of further war. In the short time available, I have presented some examples that prove that Islam is not what you may have heard or read about in the media. The Quran is not, God forbid, a book of terrorism or extremism. Rather, it is a teaching of love, compassion, and humanity. If Muslim countries acted upon the true teachings of their uh, religion, there would be no civil wars or conflicts and no scope for their troubles to be exported abroad. Certainly, if we wish to see the true picture of Islam, then we should study the era of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and of his four rightly guided successors. Their blessed examples prove that Islam is a beacon of peace and justice that enshrines universal religious freedom and pluralism. For example, during the era of Hazrat Umar, the second successor to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Islam spread to Syria and a Muslim government was formed. However, following an attack by the Roman Empire, the Muslims were forced to leave the country. History bears witness to the fact that upon their departure, the local Christians of Syria were brought to tears and fervently prayed for the Muslims to return because they had seen how the Muslim government had always protected their rights. And so it is a cause of the deepest regret and sorrow that today's Muslim governments and leaders have forgotten the true teachings of their faith and care only for their own seats of power and personal interests. Their injustices and cruelties have caused frustrations to ferment amongst their local populations. And in, uh, in turn, such grievances have fueled extremist and terrorist organizations. Anyway, during these challenging times, it is the responsibility of the major powers and the international institutions to act with justice at all times. Where conflicts arise, international organizations such as the United Nations should act impartially and equitably and their sole motivation should be to establish peace and reconciliation between all parties. The obvious truth is that if nations and groups had acted with justice in the past, then the disorder and instability we see today would not have spread and we certainly would not have faced the current refugee crisis. Another extremely significant Islamic principle is given in chapter 23, verse 9 of the Holy Quran, which states that true Muslims are those who are mindful of fulfilling their pledges and covenants and who seek to discharge the trusts that have been handed over to them. In my opinion, this principle is not only for Muslims, but is a universal principle for all nations and people. All governments and international institutions have huge trust placed in them, and it is the duty of their leaders to ensure that they fulfill them with honesty, integrity, and justice. It is the responsibility of the governments and politicians 
to serve their people and to protect the future of their nations and they should never take this burden lightly. Similarly, the primary objectives laid out in the Charter of uh, United Nations are to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to live together in peace, and to maintain international peace and security. The, UN, the UN Charter specifically states that its objectives are underpinned by a desire to save mankind from the mistakes that led to the two world wars of the 20th century. Having undertaken this huge responsibility, the United Nations must seek to fulfill its noble objectives and truly value the peace of the world as the most significant issue of our time. But regrettably, this responsibility is being ignored. I maintain that if all parties understand their responsibilities and act with justice and fulfill the rights of one another, then there is still time for the black clouds of warfare and conflict that loom all around us to pass by safely into the distance. Thus again, I advise the major powers of the world to strive wholeheartedly and earnestly in the cause of the world peace. May Allah grant the people of the world wisdom and enable mankind to set aside personal interests for the sake of the common good. If we fail in this task, then, as I have said on many occasions, the world is moving rapidly towards another world war whose repercussions could easily last for generations, given that various nations now possess nuclear weapons. The consequences of such a war do not even bear thinking about. The question we should all ask ourselves is whether we desire to leave behind a better world for our children and future generations to live in? Or do we wish to hand over a legacy of warfare, bloodshed, and untold sorrow and grief. May Allah protect mankind and have mercy on us and enable all people to act with justice, common sense, and goodwill towards others, so that we are able to protect our children and coming generations. With these words, I would now take your leave, but before doing so, I would like to once again thank you for accepting, uh, accepting our invitation. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much. Honored guests, it is our tradition to conclude our session with a silent prayer by raising our hands. You may join us in whatever way you prefer. May I request beloved Hazur to lead us in silent prayer. Silent, silent prayer. prayer. I mean, so I uh, think the speech was uh, well, very, uh, very well thought out because he had insights into the Swedish um, situation in regards to the refugee uh, situation, and uh, that was uh, very interesting. And he had a very unique take on the on the refugee situation here in Sweden. He thought that refugees should have a responsibility to the society, 
and uh, also that the Swedish uh, people shouldn't have um, shouldn't be neglected in the regards to that so that's um, that was very interesting it's, it's not something politicians would say in Sweden so well it was very very fruitful for me I have uh, another picture for Islam and uh, your re religion and uh, the world should be much more better place uh, if uh, more people should uh, listen to you it's been a very uh, an event of inclusion, and uh, I've learned lots today. And it's, I would like to say, that it's inspirational. But it's it's more than that. It gives hope. I was grateful that he came to us, and uh, he really gave us some guidance on uh, on a problem that we might have here in Sweden. And I'm happy the way he he didn't just let alarm bells go off, but he was a bit cautionary and um, opening our eyes so that we don't just close them to make a conflict go away and uh, it was very concrete and for that I'm grateful. It was a wonderful experience. I was uh, at the invitation of the new mosque in Malmö and that really inspired me and now I'm uh, twice as inspired because now I've listened to His Holiness and he heard more wisdom and more love and peace because that is uh, the message and the more he speaks about it the more inspired and impressed I get. It's uh, such a wonderful ambition to bring people together because there are too many dark forces that try to separate people and create conflict. So it's such a wonderful ambition and I think you really succeeded because uh, when we meet uh, our eyes open and we learn new things and uh, we can fight prejudice because there's a lot of prejudice about Islam and uh, Many people don't know what the Ahmadiyya Muslim uh, community stands for. And when, when you meet, you learn and you understand, and then you can spread the message of harmony and peace. Well, um, I was very happy to be invited to this uh, event and to hear His Holiness speak, and that he actually spoke on topics that religious leaders here in Sweden uh, are afraid to speak about when it comes to integration and when it comes to uh, what you can expect from people who seek refuge in Sweden and what the Swedish society should, um, how the Swedish society should, should take these people in and how they should treat these people. Uh, it was a very uh, grounded speech about, you know, having their own responsibility to integrate into the Swedish society, but also the Swedish society and politicians, um, the work that they need to do in order to uh, maintain a good and stable society. Politics these days is very technocratic in a way, so to listen to a spiritual leader and, and who talks not only to, to my head but to my heart is very inspiring. And I feel more energetic than ever about that we must solve these crises which is burning our world and uh, we can solve them, the refugee crisis caused by wars and hatred uh, in the vicinity of Europe. We can solve this if we really, all of us, follow this message that love to all, hatred to none. Well, it's my pleasure, it's an honor being invited, and I think what your, uh, His Holiness says is so important. Peace, love and the harmony for everyone. I mean, everyone needs to listen to this. I, I am so inspired and it's such an important mission. So, yes, I'm, oh, I'm uplifted. When you hear the background and the uh, and the intention of Ahmadiyya Islam and what Ahmadiyya is doing around in the world. Now it is easier to understand the good work of Islam, but it is done by the Khalifa and the Ahmadiyyas.